And this is really one I wanted to focus on today. And that's because we are at risk. Our communities are at risk. The people that live up in the Wui areas are at risk. American West has been the driest it's ever been in 1,200 years. Our wildfire season is getting much, much longer. It's three and a half months longer than it was in the 70s. It's now a year-round event, as we all are seeing. Uh, the, the number of large fires in the West has tripled. Rising temperatures evaporate uh, moisture from the ground, which makes vegetation more flammable. Winter snowpacks are melting more quickly, so the forests are drier for a longer period of time. So all of that is exacerbating the problem. So there's some NASA global climate data trends out there. And, and as we would suspect and we don't want, there are going to be more fires. Uh, they're going to be more, they're going to be bigger, they're going to be more frequent, and they're going to be more widespread. The other issue is the fires are going to be larger. And what's really interesting, mega fire is like a 100,000 acre fire. In the 1970s, there were no 100,000 acre fires, just didn't happen. So it's happening more and more frequently. And uh, per the director of the University of Colorado Boulder's Earth Lab, more large fires are intensifying development, mean worse fire disasters are to come. That's what's happening. The other thing is the type of uh, vegetation that's burning are conifer forests. So there are more conifer forests burning than any other type of vegetation out there. And there's going to be a significant increase in very large fires by 2041. It's going to continue to increase because this drought is continuing uh, ongoing. So what's really interesting is the scientists studying this are finding that the number of wildfires that are going to be, we're going to be exposed to in the air could disrupt agricultural productivity create challenges for livestock, declining crop yields and quality, and really impact us from outdoor activities because of all the smoke. So this is a concern for all of the American West and absolutely a concern for Colorado. And we have to do things that are going to try to make a difference in helping minimize the risk. So Colorado has been in a 20, 22 year mega drought and it's predicted to continue to 2029 at minimum. Uh, 2018 was the warmest year in 124 years. 2020 was the second driest and warmest year ever recorded. 2021 was the warmest and driest on record. You kind of see a trend that's going on here. And 2022 is significant wildland fire protect potential. We've had a number of wildfires and they continue to increase that you can see over since uh, 2002, which was the Hayman fire. And in 2020, we had the three, three of the biggest fires in Colorado history. And those were huge, huge fires that occurred. Um, and then uh, you've seen what's been going on in Boulder County, December 31st, the Marshall Fire destroyed 991 structures. And then March 26, just a couple of weeks ago, they had the NCAR fire. The definition of the Wui areas probably has to be redefined because people living near grassy areas can get, uh, uh, they can lose everything through wildfires. So it's a risk that's moving, not just in the forest, but it's moving into the grasslands too. So this is a data that is from the uh, predictive services of the National In Interagency Fire Center. And as you can see, the state of Texas, New Mexico and Colorado, and especially the little kind of thumbprint that's going straight up, that's our front range area. So we're predicted to be above normal for fire risk in June. So that's something we're gonna have to watch out for. And Evergreen is right in the center of the target in Colorado. We are the number one risk area in the entire state of Colorado. 50% of the residents in Colorado live in wildfire risk areas. 75% of our fires in 2020 were caused by humans. So unfortunately, a lot of these fires are human caused. And the other issue is we have so much fuel. In uh, 1900s, we have about five times as much fuel that we did in the 1900s because fires naturally move through our landscape. And it's a very healthy thing for fires to burn through the landscape, work through the slash. But the, uh, the US government and the Forest Service decided to stop all fires in the early 1900s. And so that allowed more and more and more trees to grow. So we have a lot of fuel here, which is prompting these big, big fires. So the US Forest Service has also identified Evergreen as the top priority region for rock, the Rocky Mountains 
and Colorado. And their big concern as a lot of government agencies is concern for lives, property, watersheds, and environment, if anything burns down. And Jefferson County Wildfire Task Force also identifies uh, our area as being extraordinary risks. An impact of a 100,000 acre wildfire could result in the evacuation of 60,000 people, destruction of 10,000 homes, and estimated minimum $5 billion in losses. So I got some data from the Evergreen Historical Society of this, this young man who moved to Evergreen in 1895. Of course, you know, this was all burn over when we, when we come over here in 1895. They had a fire, just had a fire out there and ruined it. It burned for four years out there. That's probably the last big, big fire that happened in our area is in that time period. And our landscape, again, you know, the, the forests are really designed to manage wildfire. That's a very healthy thing to have happen. But when we have the density of forests that we have, it's a significant issue. So you hear this all the time. It's not a matter of if, but when. So what I wanted to show you is an overlay of some of these big, big fires on our areas. What if a fire the size of the East Troublesome Fire happened in our area? You can see, uh, hopefully you can see all of this. Here's conifer down here. And there's evergreen. Genesee, it basically, uh, one of these big, big fires would totally destroy our area. Here's a picture of the Cameron Peak fire overlaid on our area. So you could see the size of these fires. Unfortunately, Evergreen, because of the amount of fuel here, if we have a high wind event, it's dry. And, uh, you know, God forbid a fire really starts here it could be one of these really, really big fires because these are the kind of fires that are happening, the conditions that we're, we're in right now. So uh, this came from a, wild, a wildland risk assessment for Evergreen. If the Hayman fire occurred in Evergreen in one day, it would burn 81% of Evergreen, 9,700 homes and threaten 19,000 people. So the Evergreen Fire Rescue um, does modeling and they do analysis and predictive models of what would happen. I wanna show you uh, one of the, the pieces of data from this wildland risk assessment that was done in 2019 of a fire that would begin on I-70, a fourth mile east of Floyd Hill exit. The winds out of the Northwest at 30 miles per hour. So this is in their predictive model. So the very first thing in the first few hours, fire would cut off Evergreen and Bergen Parkway. In the first day, Highway 74 east of Evergreen would be closed. Evergreen Parkway becomes two-lane highway just north of Evergreen Lake. There'd be a big bottleneck into downtown. Evacuation of the ridge at Haiwan and Haiwan Country Club would be difficult due to the fire crossing Bergen Parkway, closing Keystone and Sugarbush Drive. And within one day, 6,800 homes burned and 12,000 people impacted. This, unfortunately, is the reality that we're facing and living in this beautiful, beautiful area. So it is up to us to get people prepared. It's up to us. That's why this program is so important. We need to help build awareness about what is the risk going on and how do we get people prepared. And our communities are not prepared at all, we have so much to do. So the Evergreen 2020 Community Wildfire Protection Plan had some really key findings and 80% of our neighborhoods are high to extreme for wildfire risk. And you can look this up in the report. After this, if you want me to give you some information on your neighborhood, just contact me and I'd be happy to get that to you. 100% of our neighborhoods have non-survivable sections of roadways. What does that mean? When, when trees and other vegetation catch on fire, they typically can burn four times their height, four times their width. So there's certain roadways in our communities where the trees are right alongside the road. So if those trees catch on fire, the firewall can cover the whole road. So that's how people, those are those non-survivable sections of roadway. This is just a part of our community wildfire protection plan, picking on Blue Creek area. And what's in red is the Blue Creek area. Everything in yellow is a non-survivable roadway. Everything in orange is a highly congested point, which would be locked up during an evacuation if people are trying to get out. And our time to evacuate, 
This is for perfect conditions. Like you can see, it's not dark. Um, the uh, time varies between 25 and 200 minutes. It, this assumes there's not a lot of uh, visitors in the area, that you don't have any traffic in the way, uh, you can go the speed limit. So you can see that just in a perfect scenario, it's about 25 to 200 minutes to evacuate the area. And if you look at what just happened with the Marshall Fire, they had to evacuate 30,000 people. The evacuation took four to five hours. They, they had lots of different ways out that were fully mitigated. Evergreen could have 30,000 people evacuating. Our evacuation could take six, nine hours or more to get out. We have two ways out. Um, and this could be a real significant issue. So the key thing for all of you, two actions, please, please, please take these. Get notified, sign up for the notification system, the emergency notification system. This is so, so important. You cannot count on people coming and knocking at your door. In fact, that is not safe for our, our first responders at all to have to go to your house to notify you. It's just not realistic, especially in a fast moving fire. Second thing is get out early, pay attention when there's smoke in the air and what's happening. And it's really important to get out early because our roads are gonna get locked up if there's a big fire here. So please, please, please pay attention to that. That's super important. So the community can really make things happen. That's where Rotary and all of our community leaders that are involved are really reaching out in the community to help people get ready. That's what's so important. And I wanna give you a, per, a perfect illustration, the community in action on a project that John Putt helped to lead. So John, why don't you come and talk about that for a second? Thanks, Cindy. So uh, I, I want to kind of give you a, an umbrella view of what's going on with uh, mitigation grants and how that all kind of trickles down to us on the ground. Uh, the Forest Service, the US Forest Service basically funds about half the budget of every state forest service in the nation. And um, up until the infrastructure bill last year, Colorado and along with the US Forest Service probably got about 20 to $40 million a year to do statewide projects. The trickle down for us was about a million dollar grant um, that was spread out all, along the whole state. So when you, you just do the math, there's 65 counties in Colorado. So um, the legislature then voted to bring in about $9 million worth of full-time grants that could trickle down to, to the communities, to the residents. And that's kind of where we're at right now. The interesting thing is that the infrastructure bill just gave the US Forest Service $50 billion for mitigation. Colorado, California, Oregon, and Washington are their feet, four key states that they wanna fund and put $7 billion into. So we're gonna go from you know, one to $8 million a year that would be available for community projects, whether that's, you know, defensible space, evacuation routes, whatever, to hundreds of millions of dollars. And what the Forest Service needs to be able to uh, use that money and what just needs to be able to write the grants and get uh, communities active in all of this funding is community buy-in. They call it a social license is the, the term in the Forest Service. And that's why our education piece is so critical. Uh, right now, we're doing a 220 acre project at Yankee Creek and Upper Bear on the Brookvale Ranch. That uh, is funded by two different grants and the landowners are land rich, uh, but cash poor. So it's a 100% grant that's funding that project. Um, we just received um, through five different neighborhood wildfire groups in collaboration with Jess at the fire department, we just received a grant that's probably valued somewhere close to $500,000, but it's a, basically a free grant to all five communities. We're gonna mitigate 14 and a half miles of evacuation routes. And so we'll be doing 30 feet of uh, fuels thinning. It's not going to be clear cutting, but we're going to get trees, you know, 10, 15, 30 feet apart on critical roadways so people can get out. 
Um, and so that'll be in Soda Creek, Old Squaw Pass, Echo Hills, Upper Witter Gulch, Upper Bear and Yankee Creek. So one of the, the I think the biggest reasons we got that grant is because of the collaboration. The, the state and the US Forest Service want to see collaboration. And, you know, through our outreach through Rotary and our partnership with the Real Estate Association, everything we're doing to get the community educated and involved is paying big, div big dividends. And there's going to be much more to come. And I think Cindy and I personally do not want to see us miss out on that opportunity. So that's why we feel like it's so important. And Jess may never get the checkbook she's going to get in the next couple of years from these grants that um, in the future. So that's kind of where we're at with grants, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity coming and it's about talking it up, right? It's people just have to pay attention. That's all. Thanks. Why don't you stay up here too? <laughs> Thank you. And I, again, that so so you kind of see the why of this program and why we're we're working on it and why it matters so much to Evergreen in this community we love. And again, I cannot thank all of you enough because you've really helped make all of this possible. So I wanted to thank you. So um, John is the leader of our safety team. I'm the leader of the education team. And well, I just want to see if you have any questions at all. I'm just watching our time. So okay. Okay. <laughs> So, oh yeah. So before, I'm going to jump in here before, and I'm going to do a little plug. Okay. And I get to do this. <laughs> okay. Um, time is of the essence, people. If you've been sitting back wondering how you can make a difference in our community, this is it. So please, uh, what, what Cindy's asking is um, for people that really, really want to devote some time and commitment to save lives in our community. This project is it. So don't, don't sit back. Join this team and be, be a game changer for our community and for generations of Evergreen. Okay, that's my plug. Okay, because she needs volunteers, committed volunteers. Okay, questions? So John, when you cut down all these trees, where does all that biomass go? And that is a great question. Uh, so the biomass is, you know, the byproduct, the limbs, the bark, everything that happens when we start cutting down trees. Uh, we are fortunate to have a community member that owns a curtain burner. So the curtain burner is basically a big turbocharged uh, fan that blows into a trench that burns all of the biomass and turns it into biochar. It'll take 10,000 tons of uh, biomass and reduce it down to about 150 pounds. So that is an incredibly efficient system. Um, and biochar is used by the agricultural industry. So um, anyway, Jess and I have been talking with uh, David Graham, who has the curtain burner. He's going to make that available. Um, one of the things we have to come up with is a landowner is going to let us dig a, a 20 foot deep trench, eight feet wide to do all this burning. But um, we have some time. We're still looking for that landowner, unless Jess came up with somebody. So um, that that is incredibly efficient. And so that's how we do it. Okay. You probably have to. Okay. I'm going to have to run. You usually have two minutes. Look, I'll be really fast. I just, I want to give a plug to Cindy. I am so fortunate we are because Cindy's my neighbor. And she got a grant um, to have our a good section of our neighborhood mitigated. And I'm a tree hugger. If you know me, I am a big time tree hugger. And, and you can tell your neighbors, you'll get over it. Honestly, there's a section where I, I literally mourned. Now I don't even notice. It's still a beautiful forest and we're safe. So thank you, Cindy. And when you're talking this up, tell people it'll be okay. It'll be okay. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your incredible leadership. You moved here, you saw a problem, you just went, okay, we'll fix it. I, I also want to give a plug to Lori for the beautiful brochures that she's put out. And those of you who live in Genesee, all of those are linked to our website. They're on our website. When we had, uh, I had to have a, a small change made in one, Lori went, no problem. She just did it and sent it back. I've got one more question for time. Way back here. <laughs> How much are those cameras you're installing? Oh. The cameras are really expensive. Just each camera lasts about five years. It's about $8,000 for a camera. It costs another $8,000 every year to maintain it. And then there's some additional licensing fees. So it's, it's about a $22,000 investment and then about a $10,000 a year ongoing thing. One of the good pieces about the cameras, if we can get Excel to get it up, it gives all this view, view ship going on, which we want. And then we've been partnering with Forest Technology Systems to see if they can get a grant for another 60 cameras in the front range area. So that's additional ongoing kind of work that we're trying to help advocate for, so. And it, it's good to mention that those will be public viewing cameras, right? And right now there's already a camera on Squaw. We'll, we'll have Conifer Mountain, so you can kind of, you know, bird's eye view. Yeah, and then you get over towards uh, Bailey, you got uh, a camera over there and then over off of Cole Creek Canyon. But really for us in kind of the evergreen area, at least we're gonna have two points to look from, which will be Conifer Mountain, looks right down to the north and then Squaw Pass looks to the south. Um, and you'll, if you smell smoke and it's blowing hard, check your camera real quick. And if it looks close, get out of there. Yeah, and by the way, I've made some revisions to the website. If you haven't looked at it, please, 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 please look at it. Let's look at the information that's in there. There's some great information about all the official uh, communication channels you should focus on. If you smell smoke, what you should do. If you see smoke, what you, sh you should do. Please look at that website. That'll help you a lot. So 